Hello, I'm Kendall House, and welcome back to Anth 105, Evolution and Human Behavior. In this part of the course, we're going to be focusing on kinship and family, and why uh, families are so important to nearly all of us. In this presentation, we'll look at some of the background to that, uh, focusing on Charles Darwin's reflections on the relationship between altruism and family. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, I'm Kendall House, and this presentation is called Darwin's Special Puzzle. So what was that puzzle? Well, the way we're going to approach it is in relationship to a problem in the philosophy of science um, that came to be connected to Darwinian approaches. And uh, so this is a proposition that a philosopher might make, all swans are white. And indeed, that's a testable uh, proposition. We can go out in the world and we can look for evidence that would confirm it. And of course, the evidence that would confirm our proposition would be finding white swans. So this became an issue in the 20th century philosophy of science. It became a kind of an exemplar. And the argument was made um, that no matter how many uh, white swans one observed, um, one still couldn't be sure that the proposition was true because there might always be that one black swan um, that disconfirmed it. So a better approach was suggested um, by a philosopher named Karl Popper. And he said, well, instead of formulating our hypotheses to find evidence to confirm them, maybe we should set them up to find evidence that would falsify them. So if we were going to falsify this, of course, we'd want to find a swan that wasn't white. And assuming that swans come in black and white, rather than trying to find white swans to confirm it, we could go out and we could look for black swans that would falsify that statement. So this became uh, Karl Popper's uh, contribution, one of many, uh, to the philosophy of science. The idea that we should strive to falsify our theories by coming up with hypotheses that would falsify them. Now, as it turns out, um, you might be saying by now, well, so what? Uh, how's that related to what we're talking about this week? Well, it relates to Darwin, as does everything we talk about. And it turns out on this point, as on many, as surprisingly, um, Darwin was ahead of his time. So in working out his theory of natural selection, he didn't just amass supporting evidence, which he certainly sought out evidence that would confirm it. Um, but he also put a lot of effort into identifying evidence that could falsify his ideas. It was as if he was anticipating um, Karl Popper, uh, who was a century ahead of him. So he had a section in the Origin of Species from the first edition on that he kept modifying and developing. Um, but from the first edition, he had statements about what would falsify his theory. For a famous example is this statement, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So Darwin uh, tried to focus in on organs of extreme perfection, as he called them, like the eye, and then to seek evidence uh, that they could have been formed by numerous successive and slight modifications. Um, but he was very attuned to focusing on what was most difficult to explain if one applied natural selection and gradualism and descent with modification and his other theories. Another example of this is what he called his special puzzle. And so he writes that one special difficulty at first appeared to me insuperable and actually fatal to my whole theory. 
And what was this? Well, it had to do with ants. And ants were being observed with greater and greater accuracy by the mid-19th century. And uh, naturalists were becoming aware that ants varied a lot in terms of their anatomy. And they also appeared to have a social division of labor. So what was so puzzling? Well, the first was the division of ants into caste. Um, but what really made it difficult was that these castes, some of them were sterile. So ants are divided into those that reproduce the queen and the males that uh, produce sperm uh, for the queen. And then into the workers, and the workers don't reproduce. And of course that's kind of challenging given Darwin's theory. So he said there's two questions, or he wrestled with two questions about ants. And one was just the question of whether small gradual steps could lead to sterile casts that differed in their anatomy. And this is an image that he drew of variation in pigeon skulls. Um, but Darwin argued that yes, there was no reason to think um, that, that uh, natural selection could not differentiate ants as it had other living things. So this was not the really big problem. Um, the really big problem was the question, what's in it for the workers? And that's because the workers don't get to reproduce. So what in the world are they living for? And the whole point of life, um, if we take an evolutionary perspective, would appear to be reproducing. And here's these worker ants who make up the great majority, um, but they aren't reproductives. And this then raises what's called the altruism question. These ants would appear to be behaving in an altruistic manner um, to a very high degree. So what, what is altruism? This is a working definition that we'll start with. And it's defined in various ways in different contexts by different thinkers. But we're going to say that altruism is any behavior that increases the reproductive success of another organism at some reproductive cost to the altruist. And it would appear in the case of worker ants that that cost is very high uh, because they have no reproductive fitness. Um, they, they give it all uh, to just the queen and uh, the male that inseminates her. So Darwin uh, wrestled with this and he suggested a possible answer that was going to be overlooked uh, for the next hundred years. And he said this difficulty disappears when it is remembered that selection may be applied to the family as well as to the individual. So what Darwin raised in explaining why you would have a sterile cast of ants and reproductive, and the reproductives, is that it comes down to cooperation in the family. And this would be picked up, as we'll see, a century later by a young uh, graduate student named William Hamilton. So let's uh, go back. We started with Karl Popper and uh, this idea of falsification. And Popper is also famous uh, for writing in 1976 um, I have come to the conclusion that Darwinism is not a testable scientific theory, but a metaphysical research program, a possible framework for testable scientific theories. And that was uh, in his intellectual autobiography um, that came out and was published in 1976. However, uh, this is often noted then by critics of Darwin. Here we have Karl Popper, the great philosopher of science, um, asserting that Darwinism is a research program that's metaphysical. Um, but it's often overlooked that Popper changed his mind, uh, and just two years later, um, he wrote that the fact that the theory of natural selection is difficult to test has led some people, and he said, and I among them, uh, to claim that it is a tautology. I mention this problem because I too belong among the culprits. So uh, by this time he had uh, reversed his thinking. 
and it was a complete reversal. I have changed my mind about the testability and logical status of the theory of natural selection, and I am glad to have an opportunity to make a recantation. And, of course, part of that was the many biologists who pointed out um, that Darwin was probably the first scientist to ever actually apply uh, Popper's famous idea of falsification. Thank you for listening.